Today, we're going to be doing something that I'm sure a few of you will find controversial, and that's the simple process of closing in a window without removing it and framing it in to mount my TV to the wall where the window opening once was. Now, to start this process, we obviously have to remove the curtain, curtain rod, blinds, blind hardware, and insulation that's been sitting in the window for over a year now, and then move on to removing all the drywall for the area. I'm removing a 4 foot section of drywall as that will make it nice and simple to put new drywall in when I'm done. This is an east facing window and leaving it exposed without the insulation in it causes my living room to heat up by about 10 degrees during the summer and makes it absolutely unbearable so I won't be missing having this window by having it filled in. Removing the drywall was apparently far more difficult than I was anticipating even though I'm the one that installed it last year. Removal is normally just simply cutting relief lines for where you want the drywall to break at and then pulling the drywall away from the screws. But apparently I perfectly countersunk all of these screws so they were holding the drywall really well. For the window here, since we're not removing it, we're just going to build another frame that sits inside of the window and screws to the existing frame. I'm also adding a 2x12 to the assembly here, so that way I have a very solid surface to mount my TV to when I'm done. You could do this with really any material, but I have a surplus of 2x12s in my yard, so I grab this one and cut it to size. Once the frame is screwed together, simply mount it into the existing window opening, make sure it's sitting flush with the rest of the wall, and begin screwing it in. I did have to cut a small notch out of the bottom of the frame so that the window openers can fit inside of the notch and not cause the frame to sit away from the wall. Thank you. 
next thing that I'll be doing here is adding the electrical outlets for the TV. And I'll be doing that by piggybacking off of an existing outlet. In order to get to this outlet wiring, after removing the outlet extension and outlet cover, I'll be cutting a slot out of the drywall in order to have an area to access the existing wiring and run new wiring. After that's removed, I just need to cut out a section for the new outlet box to go in my existing insulation. Normally this wouldn't be needed, but since I have polystyrene insulation in this wall, I have to cut out a template for it to fit into when I put drywall up. I'm not too concerned about that section of drywall that I took out, as I eventually have to remove all of the drywall along this wall and insulate it properly, and then add new drywall, so I'll fix it then. But if I wasn't doing that, it would be a simple patch job for the wire run. I apologize for all the hunting that the camera has been doing for focus. I didn't realize I really needed to disable continuous autofocus for this shot. Once the wire route is cleared and ready, it's time to grab a paddle bit and put a hole between the stud bays for the wiring to be run. Before you start working on any electrical, make sure that you have no power going to the wires. I always put my tester into the outlet as I go flip the breaker off just to make sure it's actually off. With the power turned off, go ahead and pull out the existing outlet to get access to the wires. Go ahead and strip approximately an inch of sheathing off of the new wires to add to the existing outlet.
Now, much to many people's dismay, we're going to use backstabs for the addition to this outlet, as this old outlet, which I will eventually replace, does not even have screw terminals. We want to stab in black to the black side, white to the white side, and then add the ground bar to the other grounds in the box. To do this, I'll be using a new wire nut, a green ground nut that allows for a wire to slide through the top to still allow a wire to connect to the outlet. Before turning the power back on, we'll slightly prepare the other end of the wire that will be going into the new box. We'll strip the black and white wires, and then add on Wago splice connectors to them to easily remove them when we're ready to fully attach everything. Before we prep the drywall to go on, we need to add the wire run that goes up to where the outlet for the TV actually will be, so I can have the power wire hidden up behind the TV. And also because this TV has like the shortest power wire in existence. For the time being, all I'm doing is drilling the hole through the 2x4s and running a wire to pretty much just chill in the wall cavity. As I add in the layers of polystyrene insulation, with the wiring run behind it, I cut out the spot for the box to sit in the insulation, this time cutting the ears the proper way the first time. The reason for the ear design is so that the tabs on the old work boxes I'm using are able to fully open up once behind the drywall. Now that it's drywall time, it's simply a matter of measuring the, out the distances I need, scoring the white side of the drywall, bending it at the score mark, and then cutting along the back side. The wonderful splash of purple paint on there is an indicator that this piece of drywall came from Home Depot's coal cart, so it was only like two bucks, which is amazing. With the drywall inside of the house, I just have to measure where my electrical box will be and mark that on the drywall and then cut out that box before hanging it up.
With the drywall cut and ready, it's just a matter of adding drywall screws in, all the studs, spacing them out about 18 inches between them as you go up. Always make sure that the head of the screw is just barely below the surface of the drywall. If you drive the screw too far in, it won't actually hold the drywall and can cause it to tear out and away from the wall. As much as I'd love to go back and fix all the focus hunting that's happening in these clips, sadly, these are one-time shots that I can't go back and redo, as once the work is done, it's, um, done. Eventually, I'll have some sort of cameraman to help out to prevent issues like this in the future. While editing this video, though, after seeing this happen, I have adjusted a few settings on my camera to hopefully prevent this from happening in the future. Apparently this whole video is how to record things out of focus 101. Definitely not my finest work and I'm sorry about that. Here we're just adding the recessed outlet to the drywall that just got hung up. It's simply a matter of adding the black wire to the gold screw, white wire to the silver screw, and bare copper to the green screw. Moving on to the bottom piece of drywall, it's just the same as the other piece. Move all of your measurements to your drywall, gently score with your razor blade, bend the drywall along the cut, and then cut along the backside to cut the drywall. And apparently I forgot to record me cutting out the electrical box, but you guys didn't really miss anything there. Here you can see me using my pry bar to keep the drywall lifted up, tight against the top piece while I screw everything in. Hindsight here, I should have added at least one more 2x4 along the window for additional mounting points for the drywall, but ultimately it won't be an issue. And we're about halfway done with this job. I still have to add the outlet box, wire in the two outlets, 
connect them to the top outlet and the new hot wire that's sitting in the wall, tape and mud the drywall, sand it, texture it, and then paint it before hanging up my TV. If you like the content I'm putting out, make sure to like, comment, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with all new content as it comes out. If you want access to videos as soon as I finish and upload them, join me as a channel member or over on Patreon and you'll have access to them just a bit earlier than the general audience. Now, to pick up where we left off, we're going to put in the new two-gang box into the drywall and insert the wires from the wall above and the wall to the side into the box, making sure the Wago connectors don't come off until we're ready as those wires are actually now hot. With the box in the wall, go ahead and tighten down the wing screws on the box to hold it tightly in place. Before putting the outlets into the two gang box, we're going to prep the outlets first by putting jumpers across the outlets. Using a six inch piece of wire, ideally a white wire for this one, Put a jumper going from silver terminal to silver terminal across the two outlets, and then a black wire going between the two gold terminals. When it comes to the ground wire, using a 10 inch piece of bare copper will easily jump between the two outlets and give you enough to connect to the wire nut or Wego block. <laughs> What's up? You know, one thing that people don't say about having a dog or a shusky is that sometimes they'll just demand attention and they don't care if you're recording. So, we have a puppy break for a few Hi. moments. Enjoy. <laughs> yes, I love you. Can daddy get back to work? Thanks. Alright, back up. Back up. Thank you. Back up. Since I'll be using Wigo blocks, I'm simply taking a 4 inch wire and backstabbing it into the respective terminals. When it comes to connecting the wires to the Wagos, it's just a matter of opening up the tension clip, sliding the wire in, and locking the clip back down. Now, as I'm doing this, the black wire inside of the Wago connector I have there is actually hot, so I do have to be careful not to touch it as I put the three-way Wago on for combining the wires. When it comes to combining the wires, it's just a matter of putting the similar colored wires into their respective Wego blocks. The reason we have a three-way Wego is because this box in the wall is combining the outlet we got power from to the right, this box with the two outlets, and also the outlet up above with the recessed outlet that the TV will be connected to.
Once the outlets are pushed into the box, making sure to be careful not to touch the terminals on the sides, for if you do, the angry pixies will bite you quite aggressively, and it's not very fun when that happens, go ahead and screw in the outlets to the box, and then add your cover. Make sure to test your outlets with your tester to verify everything works and is wired correctly. The reason I check for this after I have the outlets in is because if you have a poor connection made, you're liable to cause it to break or come apart when you're shoving the outlets into the box. With the electrical taken care of, it's time to move on to my favorite part, the drywall mudding. To start with, I'm going to cut a couple of strips of drywall tape for the two lines that I have to do. Since I don't have the right side piece of drywall ready, I won't be applying any tape or mud to the right side. Mixing up a batch of hot mud is quick and easy, just make sure you have water in your bucket before pouring in your drywall powder, otherwise it tends to get stuck to the bottom. The consistency we're aiming for is about the same as pancake batter, just be careful when using it as it makes it more likely to fall off of your drywall knife and your hawk as well, and make quite a mess. When it comes to applying the mud and tape, it's a fairly straightforward process, but will likely take a bit of finesse to get it right. The first coat though, you don't have to worry too much about. Start off by applying a 4 to 6 inch wide layer of mud across the joints that you're going to be taping before applying your tape to the wet joint. When using paper tape, it'll have a crease in the middle and you want to make sure that the crease side goes towards the wall, so that way when the sides of the tape lay flat, they lay flat against the wall and does not promote any bubbles forming in the middle from lifting. Once the tape is laying in the mud, Use your drywall knife to apply medium pressure to set the tape into the mud and remove any excess mud from underneath. Then, use your knife at an angle, pressing the outside edge of the knife against the wall on the outside of the mud to remove any excess mud so you don't have a hard edge on the wall. It just minimizes the amount of sanding you'll have to do later. The first layer of mud doesn't have to be amazing as there will be plenty more going on and you'll be sanding a good bit too. One thing I do in between coats, after the mud has set up for about 30 minutes or so, is I use my drywall knife to scrape off any high spots from the mud. Once your first coat is dry, it's time to move on to the second coat of mud. For the second coat, I typically aim for a consistency of like, cake frosting. The process for the second coat is pretty much the same as the first, 
Just slop in a large amount of mud along the path you're wanting to spread it across. Then come back with your 12, 14, or 16 inch knife and spread it out. Keeping your knife at around a 45 degree angle to the wall to get a nice and thin coat. After the second coat is dried, you'll want to go ahead and sand the mud until it's flat and see if you need a third coat. I'm using 120 grit sandpaper and a full face mask as sanding drywall, even with the shop vac attached to my sander, gets dust absolutely everywhere. After sanding, we can see a few spots that need some more attention, so a third coat will be put on to fill in any remaining problem areas. Here with the third coat, the main focus is anywhere that I noticed an issue after sanding. And it's simply a matter of slopping mud into the general area of it, and then using my 16 inch knife to get a nice and smooth finish that will need minimal sanding. No matter how good of a filter the shop vac has in it, it still creates a cloud with drywall dust. It's kind of amazing that it actually created a general haze that the camera was able to pick up. But this is the final sanding coat before adding texture, so you're wanting to make sure all edges are sanded fully flat with no lips and that there are no high or low spots. When it comes to wall texture spray, or really any spray cans that you ever use, it's always best practice to soak the can in hot water for about 5 minutes before use. Wall texture spray really benefits from this because if the contents of the can are under about 70 degrees or so, it sprays notably blotchier and looks terrible. I always opt to spray with a very fine spray pattern as I don't really like the splotchy look that some people tend to enjoy. So with the can shaken up and set to its finest setting, I just spray from side to side with a consistent motion, keeping my arm parallel to the wall, not twisting my wrist as I spray. If you twist away while spraying, you'll get a more splattered effect that's inconsistent.
Once it's sprayed and dried, it should give you a very consistent and even finish that offers a good bit of hiding over any imperfections that may have ended up in the final mudding process. And now it's time for a speed round for painting. I'm using Glidden's Diamond Paint in Elemental Gray for my walls. It's a wonderful single coat paint that dries quickly and leaves a wonderful finish. It doesn't splatter everywhere when rolled at a somewhat quick pace, and it's a combination paint and primer, so it can go directly over bare drywall. The caveat being that if you have an oil-based finish on the wall previously, it will not bond well at all, and you'll need to use a dedicated primer if that's the case. With the wall painted, it's time to move the TV and mount it to the newly finished wall. And that's all for this rather lengthy video. If you like the content I'm putting out, make sure to like, comment, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with all new content as it comes out. Thanks so much for watching, take care.